Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments using the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Helen Eaton. Helen is a member of SIL International since 2002, and she currently works as a senior linguistics consultant for the Tanzania branch of the SIL, where she's also the branch linguistic coordinator. Prior to joining SIL International, she studied at the University of Reading in the UK, where she obtained her PhD in linguistics in 2002. She wrote her PhD thesis on the grammar of focus in Sondawe, a Khoisan language. She continues working on Sandawe as well as related Bantu languages as part of the Mbeya cluster project. Her research interests include Sandawe, particularly grammar and discourse, Bantu languages, discourse, dense aspect mood, and orthography. So please join me in welcoming Helen as she gives her talk, Grammatically Conditioned Tone Lowering in Sandawe. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'd like to talk about uh, grammatically conditioned tone lowering in Sandawi, and I'll explain the significance of the dictic photo later. I should also say at the start that I don't consider myself a phonologist. That was maybe clear from Anna's description then. Um, I'm approaching the topic from the point of view of how tone lowering in Sandawi uh, functions in the grammar rather than from the point of view of someone trying to adequately describe what is actually going on with the tone lowering phonologically or explaining the origins of it. So for that, you will have to look elsewhere. And I've included some references, which would be a good place to start. So I'm going to start by uh, briefly describing lexical tone in Sandawi and how that's been analysed. And then I'm going to move on to talking about grammatically conditioned tone lowering. And I'll describe that by illustrating it with um, some genitive noun phrases first. Then I'm going to look at some noun phrases with adjectives and how the same process is exhibited there. And then look at the same process again, this time in clauses of different types and look at how it interacts with conjunctions, clause types, as well as focus. And I'll end on a note about the orthography and the implications for the orthography of the tone lowering process. So let's start with some basics of lexical tone in Sandawi. Um, the language has uh, two underlying tone levels, high and low. There is a surface mid-tone, which you hear, um, and it can be explained as a downstepped high. And Sandawe has a phonemic vowel length contrast and high and low tones occur on both short and long vowels, but low toned long vowels are rare. Rising tones only occur on long vowels, um, but falling tones occur on both short and long vowels. All contour tones can be analyzed as sequences of level tones. Word final low tones fall slightly, which is relevant to uh, recognizing the difference between underlying highs and lows after grammatically conditioned tone lowering, as we'll see shortly. And uh, here are just some words to illustrate um, the, the, the tones that we see on short and long vowels. So high tone on a short vowel, sana, beeswax. High tone on a long vowel, cha, cooking pot. Low tone on a short vowel, Qua, return, low tone on a long vowel, dong, type of tree, rising tone on a long vowel, cha, tears, falling tone on a short vowel, ta, run with a singular subject, and falling tone on a long vowel, chang, fat. Rightward tone spread occurs in non word final morais, so a low tone is realized as a high falling tone when it follows a high tone, as an example one, Timesa, she cooks, the low toned third person feminine singular realis pronominal clitic, sa, is attached to a verb stem ending in a high tone and therefore surfaces with a high falling tone rather than um, a low tone. And in two, uh, the high tone subject focus clitic, a, is attached to a noun stem, humbu, uh, cow ending in a low tone and therefore surfaces with a rising tone, umboa, uh, rather than a high tone. 
High tone spread applies across syllable boundaries in monomorphemic words, as well as multimorphemic words, but low tone spread applies across syllable boundaries in multimorphemic words only. The association of tones to words of differing syllabic patterns isn't predictable, but there are some tendencies. There's a strong tendency for the high tone to be carried on more syllables than the low tone. So that leaves the low tones associated to the syllables at the word boundaries. So um, examples like three, gawa, and four, klabiso, um, are where the only low tones are word initial or word final are more common than examples like five and six, tata and gelimba, where um, there are word medial low tones as well. There's obviously a lot more going on in lexical tone in Sandawi than what I've touched on. So if you are interested in that, please see these references uh, for more details, particularly those from Ed Elderkin. So let's move on to look at what I'm actually going to talk about, grammatically conditioned tone lowering. Uh, this terminology I'm using corresponds to what Elderkin refers to as changes in word key. And another linguist who's looked at this, Sander Stamen, um, calls, the lowering, calls this the lowering of the pitch level. Our understanding, the three of us, of the phenomenon is largely comparable, um, as far as I can tell, but we have used different terminology. There are some differences, though, in how we characterize the extent of the tonal changes of the affected words, though, which I'll mention in a moment. So example seven is an example of what we're talking about. Uh, grammatically conditioned tone lowering in a genitive noun phrase. So we have two nouns here, the name gele and mado, meaning gourd. Um, both are all high toned words at the underlying level. But when these are understood as in a genitive relationship with the first noun, the modifier and the second, the head, uh, the tone pattern of the head is um, lowered as indicated by the downward arrow. So we have gele mato. For the speakers I worked with, the tone pattern was not just lowered, but neutralized. So in the sense that there was no difference between an underlying high and an underlying low once uh, the lowering had taken place, there was um, no difference between them. Um, the only remnant of the original tone pattern is in the word final tone, which is level if it was originally high and falling if it was originally low. For Elderkin, and also I think, as I, if I understand correctly, for Stamen as well, the contours of the original tone pattern were kept, but they were um, pronounced at a lower pitch level. And some research that I've done has suggested this could be dialect related, this difference, and hot off the press, as of an email from Ed um, Elderkin this morning, that he would agree it's probably a dialect issue. Example eight um, shows the same type of construction, but this time we've got a pronoun as the modifier. So G, la, I, and goat, uh, the underlying tone patterns are high and rising. But for my goat, we have G, la, um, with the tone lowering of the second word. There are two kinds of exceptions to this process. Um, the first is shown in nine. So the modifier humble, has all low tones and as such it doesn't trigger the lowering of the tone pattern of the head so twa um, which has a rising tone um, when it is on its own still has that rising tone in cow's tail and the second type of exception is illustrated by 10 so if the head has a high low tone melody like mancha food and follows a modifier with a word final high tone like G, then there's no tone lowering of the head. G, mancha, there's no lowering of mancha. So is there anything that links these exceptions? Well, this is where the dictic comes in, sort of. Um, the sandawi if the dictic is here uh, with a rising and then a falling tone. And it occurred to me while watching a dictic run across the path in front of me one evening in Sandawe that the genitive construction is all about having a contrast between the overall melody of the head and the modifier in terms of tone pattern. So either rising from a low to a high or falling from a high to a low, like the tone pattern for the word dictic. Um, if as in nine, 
the modifier and head already have an overall low to high melody, then lowering the tone pattern of the head would remove a contrast you already had, so it's not done. Um, or if, as in 10, the modifier and the head already have an overall high to low melody, lowering the tone pattern of the head wouldn't change that already existing contrast. So again, it doesn't apply. So there is maybe something that links these two kinds of exceptions. Genitive noun phrases are very common constructions in Sandawi. Um, in some contexts, they create tonal mineral pairs with other constructions. So for example, in 11, um, the modifier kaju, lion, is followed by the head twa, tail. Um, and when it undergoes tone lowering, it results in the meaning lion's tail, kaju, twa. Um, in 12, there is no tone lowering um, and the same two words. So this time we understand these words as being um, a copular construction. Lion is a tail. Um, this kind of ambiguity is only possible when the reference a third person masculine singular, um, as otherwise there would be a disambiguating person gender number morpheme on the predicate in the copula. There are also other minimal pairs involving genitive noun phrases um, when the modifier is a locational word with a postpositional morpheme. So for example, in 13, the first two words form a tonal genitive. The head is ta, top, and the modifier gele, baobab. So the meaning is the top of the baobab. And the third person masculine singular realis pronominal clitic attached to this noun phrase refers to the subject he. And uh, together with the verb for climb, the sentence is then understood as he climbed to the top of the baobab tree. In contrast, in 14, there's no tone lowering of the second word and therefore no tonal genitive. In order to make sense of this sentence, um, the word gele needs to be understood as the subject. And it's also a man's name in Sandawi, so the meaning is gele climbed to the top. And the only difference between these two examples is the lack of uh, tone lowering. A tonal genitive can itself be the modifier in another uh, tonal genitive. So we get examples like 15. Um, we have um, they, and in the full sentence, it means they would feed the child millet flour porridge. So flour of millet is um, one tonal genitive. And then it's the modifier of ringiso, uh, porridge in another tonal genitive. So the meaning is porridge of flour of millet or millet flour porridge. So let's move on to noun phrases with adjectives. Um, and in this, I include numerals. Uh, they also show grammatically conditioned tone lowering. So when a noun is followed by an adjective, which has undergone tone lowering, the two words are understood as a noun phrase. So as in 16, kachu, me, a big lion. And when a noun is followed by an adjective without the tone lowering, the two words are understood as a copula again. So, me, a lion is big. And these two constructions show an interesting relationship with specificity, which is marked in Sandawe by a floating low tone and, and nasalization, which affects the word final vowel. So when the noun is marked as specific, the adjective doesn't, go, doesn't undergo tone lowering as shown in 18 and 19. So in 18, both the noun and the adjective carry the specificity morpheme and the construction is a noun phrase, the big lion. In 19, only the noun is marked as specific and the construction is a copula, the lion is big. I'd like to um, move on now to look at grammatically conditioned tone lowering in clauses. There are several contexts in which a verb undergoes the same tone lowering process we've seen in nouns and adjectives. So firstly, in a realis clause, as in 20, um, gelea coma, gele crawls. The underlying low high verb tone pattern um, is lowered after the subject marked with the subject focus morphine. 
The tone lowering of the verb also happens when there's an object. So, gelea, somba, glomo. Gele buys a fish. Uh, and one reason for uh, assuming or analyzing this tone lowering of verbs as being really the same process as that which is happening to nouns and adjectives is that the same exceptions relating to tone melodies occur. So when a verb with a high low tone melody occurs in a clause of this type, like here in 22, quena, um, which is high low for snore, um, gelea, quena, uh, we don't have the tone lowering because the preceding word ends in a high tone and the verb has the high low tone melody. There are also additional exceptions, though, which aren't found in the nouns and adjectives that are specific to the use of this process in clauses. So firstly, if the verb is marked with a realis pronominal clitic, as in 23, gele timea, um, gele cooks, its tone is not lowered. Uh, secondly, if uh, the verb is marked with a conjunction, such as the high tone nasalization, which is a coordinating conjunction, as in 24, um, its tone is not lowered. So, gelea timeng, hene, gele cooks and sweeps. But as you see, the, the tone of the following verb, hene, is lowered. And thirdly, if the verb is marked as durative by the morpheme yo, um, as in 25, its tone is not lowered. So, gelea timeo ba hik, um, gele carried on cooking and then went. You'll see that uh, the tone pattern of another constituent is lowered though. Uh, the narrative conjunction ba is analyzed as having an underlying high tone because its tone is level, it doesn't uh, fall at the end, um, but it occurs here with a low one a low tone, so it's understood to have undergone the tone lowering process. Um, the subjunctive set of conjunctions um, undergoes tone lowering in the same way as the narrative set. So examples 26 and 27 um, give us the narrative conjunction and the subjunctive conjunction respectively. Um, in this case, they are the same uh, segmentally. So sa time, and then she cooked versus sa tine, and then she should cook. So both of the conjunctions undergo the tone lowering, but the behavior of the verb is different. So in 26, the verb occurs with its underlying tone pattern because it's found in a clause with a narrative conjunction and there's no so subject uh, focus marker and no realis pronominal clitic. So that under those uh, circumstances, it, contain, it surfaces with its underlying tone pattern. In contrast, the tone pattern of the verb in the same context is lowered if the conjunction is subjunctive rather than narrative, as in 27. So for third person feminine singular, you can have a tonal minimal pair because of this, uh, because the conjunctions are the same, but for other persons, the conjunctions would also be different. Tone lowering can also create uh, minimal pairs for focus in irrealist clauses, such as these examples. 28 and 29. So if the verb occurs with its underlying tone pattern, there's focus on the polarity or on the verb. So hoa times, hoa will cook or hoa will cook. Um, and if the tone pattern of the verb is lowered, something else must be the focus, such as the subject. So hoa times, hoa will cook. A different use of tone lowering, or rather the absence of tone lowering, but one which has some uh, similarity to its use in focusing in the irrealis, is what Eldekin termed the exclamatory clause. And this is a clause that, uh, with certain exceptions, contains no subject marking morphemes at all and has every element of its structure realized on tone level one. Um, in Eldekin's analysis, and therefore in mine, that there is no tone lowering. So example 30 illustrates this, a lion is big. So there's an exclamatory uh, force to this sentence. If the verb in this example uh, undergoes tone lowering, it's understood uh, as a noun created by zero derivation. And um, therefore the two words now form the genitive noun phrase we saw at the beginning. So bigness of a lion. 
It's quite common for a verb with its object to be nominalized and as a sentence constituent, but usually there is a nominalizing morpheme uh, attached to the verb, such as what we can see in 32. So, great, ere, geotu, geoto, lineo, nao, ni. One day we went hunting pigs, or one day we went pig hunting. Uh, this could be analyzed as the verb being nominalized and then being the head of the, a genitive noun phrase with pigs as the modifier, um, or as the verb lineo, hunt, together with its object, geoto, being nominalized by, by the morpheme o but the tone lowering process is, um, is the same. Um, the, verb, the fact that the verb occurs with a lower tone pattern fits with either interpretation. So either the genitive noun phrase explanation, um, but it could also be argued that the analysis of the noun and the verb being nominalized together um, as fits this explanation as the verb has no subject marking and as such would have a lowered tone pattern in the clause. So to end on an orthographical note, um, it's clear that tone lowering bears a high functional load um, and needs to be represented at least to some extent. And this is um, what has been done in the orthography. So a hyphen is used before the constituent which undergoes tone lowering in many cases. So to give you a taste of this, here are uh, three orthographical words in Sandawe. Hewe, he, pla, goat, and baloi, which is either the verb he will herd or an agentive noun derived from balo, herd, meaning herder. So if these three words are put together with no tone lowering, we get he will herd a goat. Hewe, pla, baloi. If the second word undergoes tone lowering, as indicated by the preceding hyphen, we have a genitive noun phrase, his goat, and therefore the meaning is, he will herd his goat. If the third word undergoes the tone lowering, there's a genitive noun phrase comprising the second and third words, so herder of goats or goat herd, um, and therefore the sentence means, he is a goat herd. And then if both the second and third words undergo tone lowering, then the whole example is a noun phrase, uh, meaning the herder of the goats of him or his goat herd. There are actually even further possibilities. Uh, if we start bringing in different focus interpretations for the verb or if we allow his goat is a herder um, and other less likely interpretations. But I hope that um, what I've shared has given you a taste of how pervasive and important tone lowering is in Sandawe grammar. It's a process which applies to nouns, adjectives, verbs, conjunctions. Um, it plays a crucial role in disambiguating noun phrases from copular constructions, uh, realist verbs from subjunctives, and in showing different focus interpretations amongst many other things. So it's a very useful process in the grammar. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, with that, we can start the question and answer section. Um, as always, it will be open to both voice and written questions. So either write your question in the chat module and I will read it out, or you can raise your hand um, and I will give you a turn. Um, please remember that the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and it will be released on the YouTube channel. I see that Larry Hyman is raising his hand, so I'll go there to unmute. I think I've been unmuted, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk, extremely interesting. Um, I have a few little questions. Um, I assume, first of all, that all low, are there all low words? I don't remember if I saw any, and they, they would not be affected at all. Is that what I understood? Yeah, yeah. So you need to have a word, the word has to end in a high tone for it to undergo the process. So either it's all high or low high, but not high low. Or, um, there are words that are low high low. Um, so the something like the word for dick dick, which is has mm -hmm. the rising and falling. So that would undergo it. But but of the basic four, if you're saying low, all low, all high, high low, low high, 
um, yeah, you're right. The, the two that end in the high would be the ones where you would tell what was going on. But yeah, there are quite a few longer words in Sandawe where, um, yeah, you can have low, high, low. Yeah. I see. Um, I understood that uh, that it, when when the lowering does take place, you mentioned something about it staying flat rather than falling as if, if it had been a low. But of course, if it's um, low, high, low, then does it all become flat or does it still, the final low would have fallen? Uh, it would fall, yeah. Basically, the, the if, if there is a final low, genuine low, underlying low, it will fall slightly. Mm -hmm. um, it will be noticeable that the final, a lowered high is just as low, at least in the people I've worked with, just as low as a low but um, but won't sort of tail off at the end. That's that's how you can tell. So it still stays distinct, um, even though it's not final. Yeah, it does. Just but just in the word final tone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see. Because the other thing is like if you had an example like your number twenty six, where you, you showed the lowering occurring on a word that was not final. Um, I, I would assume does that merge with low? Uh, or does it does it stay or would a low tone fall there I don't because I understood that it's only before a pause or at the end of a phrase that the low would fall um, no I mean for as the way from the way I've I've understood it and analyzed it it's it's word final not phrase final so um if you at least with the person I worked mainly with um I could distinguish um sentence medial um, not before a pause, words, a, a slight fall um, versus a, a level low. Um, yeah. If I could ask just one general last question is, do you, do you think that what's behind all of this is some kind of uh, historical floating tone causing this, or do you think it's more a reduction process? This is where we need Ed, and I think the fact that he disappeared is is the power outage is in South Africa. He said he would try and stay with us as long as possible, but I think he has gone. Um, he would be the one to answer that, really. Yeah, he has gone. Um, because this is not the origins of it, some, not something I've looked at, but he has looked at it, and I, I don't think he's looked at it in terms of a floating low tone. I think it's been more... Um, to do with the movement of constituents and in his analysis um, his from the email he wrote this morning um, his thought is that the system that he recorded was an earlier system to what I've seen mm -hmm. um, and where he had he would have three tone levels in a sentence um, for me it would just be the two so either the underlying form or the lowered form um, but he would have levels pitch levels um, and he thinks the system I've observed has probably come from that. Um, so, yeah, and the movement, the word order, the constituent order is certainly relevant in the pitch levels that he recognised, but I'm, I would have to read his thesis again um, to be able to tell you more. I don't see any other questions at the moment, so I'll just ask a curiosity. I might, might have needed to remember from a previous talk, but for the orthography, um, so is the, 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 the electrical tone marked at all, like high, low? Do you see this in orthography or is it just a falling with the hyphen? Um, we just marked um, this tone lowering process with hyphen. That's the only tone mark we've used. And um, it is quite hard to judge if that is um, adequate because um, it is it is a tonal language, so you do wonder if you're reducing um, if you're losing too much by not writing it. But in general, because there there are some plenty of short words in Sandawi, but it, it's not a kind of language where you get a lot of minimal pairs for tone lexically. Um, there are some grammatical ones, but again, not many. And in our general experience, people were able to read um, without lexical tone marked. Um, there isn't a lot of changing going on. Maybe, I don't know if uh, Bonnie wanted to add anything to that um, with the tone in Sandawe. If, with the exception of this tone lowering process, um, if 
team A has high tones, it will have high tones um, in all positions. And yeah, people do seem to read it okay, but the because the tone lowering happens in so many different um, situations, like I've shown with nouns and adjectives and verbs and so on, um, it does it does create a lot of minimal pairs and that's the one with that we have marked, but we haven't marked it, which I talked about in another presentation, we haven't marked it every time it occurs because there are some uh, contexts where it, it seems natural. So if a verb has no subject marking morpheme, then in most cases it will be lowered. So marking that seemed, seemed to be too much, but um, marking the genitive noun phrases was definitely um, needed. Otherwise, you get you get a lot of sentences where you you really can't parse where all the different nouns fit in. Um, like the millet flour porridge one, if you don't do that, it is quite hard to follow. So, as far as we know, um, yeah, marking just the grammatical tone lowering is okay. But it's a because it's a hard language to read. Um, a lot of the work that SIL is doing is audio based and it's not involving reading. Although there is an orthography for those who want to use it, so it is quite hard to judge how well it's um, being used. Very interesting, thank you. And then Andrew has raised his hand. Hi, Helen. Um, Hi. This is maybe a little bit orthogonal um, to the uh, central point of the talk, but I, I, I noticed that you used sort of a minimal, two sort of minimally different phrases, one with the proper name, Gere, and then one with the Baobab Gede. Now, um, with no tonal difference, do you um, do you get? Is that like a common process to sort of zero derive names from from common nouns? Uh, and if that's the case, is that the most common way to get nouns from from or to get names from proper nouns? Or do you sometimes get tonal differences that distinguish the proper name and the common noun? Uh, I don't remember ever seeing any. I can, I'm just thinking of people I know and the names who have been, been given. Um, lots of tree names, uh, dry season and wet season, all just exactly the same um, as the, the noun. Okay. Um, one of the reasons uh, that I ask is in Gorwa and I think Iraq as well, one of the more productive ways of deriving proper names from common nouns is if the common noun uh, doesn't have, you know, a rising pitch accent or a high tone at the end. Oh, right. Uh, you just okay. stick a high tone at the end of it and that would make it. Yeah. No, I've never come across that. There are some differences which um, I wouldn't be able to tell you properly without looking them up, but to do with specificity, because um, Gele as a person, um, when it's used as a name is specific inherently, but when you're talking about the baobab, specific baobab tree, um, then you would need to put in the specificity morphemes. So there are some sentences where you can tell that a word is being used as a name because it's not marked as specific. And mm -hmm. um, it would, the, yeah, it's quite hard to explain without giving the example, but there are some cases where names versus not names, but they are identical, but their behavior with the specificity morpheme is different. Right. So that's one thing that's quite interesting. Very cool. Thank you. I see that Bonnie added in the chat that the names for uh, males tend to come from trees, whereas for women from bushes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. I have a, a small, I, I'm named after a small tree. <laughs> I suppose it's a bush, but I like to think it's a tree. I'm quite tall, so maybe that's the reason. And Elizabeth Kerr's raised her hand. Yes, um, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. I just had the clarification question. Um, so if I understand right, the lower tone is lower than a mid-tone, which is also present. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Then when you were talking about the, the possibility that this is a, a more recent version of the earlier system, you said there were three levels. But does it mean that in a language as a whole, there's four levels? You have the high, the low, the downstep, high, mid-tone, and the, the tone lowered one? 
That's a good question. Um, we again need Ed for this, I think. Um, yeah, I can't think, ex I can't think of a, an example from his work that would show that, but the way he described, um, the way he, I can picture the, the way he illustrated the sort of the word keys or the pitch levels, um, a sort of um, almost like music notation. And I think it's, it's quite possible that if you looked at all the different, if you put all the different options for the tones within a word in each level that you would end up with more than four because you would have highs and mids and lows in each of those word keys. So you could poss possibly end up with even more levels. Um, there are other things going on with tone um, in the course of a sentence as well. So I, I mean, my basics definitely simplified things. So there are a few more levels um, than I've probably made it sound. Okay, thanks. Um, and yeah, in relation to Larry asking whether it could be through a low tone, um, would you take the down the mid tone on the surface as a downstep high caused by a, a low tone? Yes, I would for that. Yes, okay, not so then, not for this grammatically the fact conditioned. That this is different would then suggest it wouldn't be caused by the low tone because you predict it comes out as the the mid then. Yeah, true. Yeah, it just it feels like it's an in, it's just a different process. That's not a very scientific um, answer, I realize, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. I had a second question, but I wasn't sure if Andrew raised his hand to react to this part. Uh, let's see, Andrew, did you want to respond to this? He says, nope, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, my second question was about this slide, actually, about the focus. Um, so you said in 29, when you have the lowering on the verb, the focus will be somewhere else. So here it's on the subject. Are there other um, constituents that can be focused in in the in that kind of scenario or is it only the subject uh there would be if there were other constituents in in the sentence if they were immediately before the verb then they would be the ones that would be focused and um that to me that's that that intuitively feels like there is something going on there because you have this this contrast um between your focus constituent and then a lowered verb immediately after it and it that somehow is marking it out as focused so the focus constituent itself doesn't have a different tone pattern but what follows it does and and therefore it stands out that's how i've understood it yeah interesting so if you focus the object would you have the object immediately before the verb then yeah i mean you do anyway um it's sov so but yeah that would be how you would do that yeah Andrew? Hi again, Helen. I'm wondering, so we've looked at, we've looked at this um, tone lowering, the specific case of tone lowering. Are there any other operations in Sandawe that can take a grammatically conditioned lowered tone and then, and then can sort of undo it or write over it in a way? Like, are there so you have your you have your lowered tone. Uh, are there situations in which I don't know, maybe like a question or something else, or like a list that would get rid of that would get rid of this configuration? Um, that's very interesting. I never thought about it in that way. Um, I'm just I moved back to this slide because I was just trying to remember some of these examples. I mean, in one sense, you might say. Um, the, the, the first example that maybe that the time had undergone the tone lowering or that was its default in in that kind of clause but mm -hmm. then because it got the realis pronominal clitic on it it was shifted back up um mm -hmm. i've always sort of not really gone into the derivation or what steps might be involved right. and just thought about it that the tone lowering does not happen when it has the pronominal clitic on it or certain other morphemes as well, but you could, um, I could could imagine an analysis whereby it was, it always occurred, but then um, kind of it came back to its underlying tone pattern when you did something else to it. But that gets into more of the sort of what is really going on in the phonology, what's the origin, mm -hmm. what's causing this. Um, 
And a lot of that also connects to what are these um, realist pronominal clitics all about anyway? Um, yeah. yeah, which is a very big topic. Um, Martha, go ahead. I was curious about something you said in response to Anna's question about um, the language being difficult to read. I don't know anything about Sandawe, so I wondered what you meant when you said that. Okay, um, well, there are 15 uh, contrastive clicks, for example. Um, so for someone who already reads Swahili, um, you've got um, basically almost the same number again of consonants to learn. Um, so it is hard in that sense. Um, and a lot of the people that I've worked with in Usandawe are um, would also find it reading in Swahili quite hard. So it's sometimes hard to know how much is um, the fact that they started off their schooling in Swahili as Sandawe speakers and, and therefore started um, behind with a struggle. And therefore their literacy skills in Swahili aren't great. Um, and then when they're trying to read Sandawe with, um, yeah, 15 different clicks plus um, aspirated and unaspirated consonants and a, a lot of a lot of consonant distinctions basically um, short and long vowels nasalized vowels yeah <laughs> it, it is hard to read in the sense I guess I'm comparing it to where I work now in Mbeya in the south of Tanzania with um, languages where someone who reads Swahili well could pick up um, the orthography of the languages near here and they would need two or three symbols explained and then they're off and they can read really easily. Um, Sandawi is not like that. Okay, I see. Yeah, I work with Kihehe actually and I know people just write okay. it based on being able to write Swahili that they can yeah. just adapt it themselves. Right. Um, yeah, so, so it's I'm same area, exactly. Bena and Pangua are similar. Yeah. You you can really read them very easily. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, a very different kettle of fish for Sandawi, yeah. So you think it's partially about the sort of typological distance between their original education in Swahili and the Sandawe writing? I think that must come into it. I mean, I think uh, I've, I've, I've got some contacts with some uh, Sandawe speakers who've done well at learning the orthography. Um, they are sort of exceptional people who've really put the effort into um, learning the systems of the, the different clicks and the symbols. Um, but obviously in Tanzania, there's no, there is no education program using um, Sandawe. So it's, it's quite limited, the reading material and the practice that people get. But there are a few people who can certainly manage it well. And it, it is, I'd say it's a very good system. Um, uh, there are, the, no orthography is perfect and there are compromises, but there's, um, it is, a system that works it's just a, a challenge if you've um all your life have have been writing in swahili only um and you have to sort of double the number of symbol sound symbol correspondences that you need to remember that that can be quite a challenge that makes sense thank you and if there's no further questions or comments for today See no raised hands and nothing in the chats. Oh, then I think uh, we will wrap it up. Um, so thank you again, Helen, for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley Net webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and the entries for each presentation are added to the bibli bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 13th of July, and will be presented by um, Peggy um, Lungili. Sorry for pronunciation of the name. Uh, and it will be titled uh, Co-occurrence of Verb Extensions in Activity Verbs in Ki uh, Sukuma. Um, so with that, Helen, thank you again. And thanks everyone for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar.